for some questions and take advantage of this opportunity to speak to our, our speakers. Yes? I have a question for Petra. Um, I recently read that York University is introducing a social enterprise concentration within their business program. Um, kind of a two-part question. Do you think this is something that other universities are going to um, include in their offerings? But also perhaps, do you think that this is something that maybe should be kind of uh, distributed within the traditional concentrations of marketing and finance and operations so that it's not such a siloed effect that it kind of contrasts with that traditional business versus this new age business? So it's interesting to have this great um, addition, but also kind of create separation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me, I am aware of that program. And, <coughs> pardon me, I had a bit of a cold. So let me answer it this way, is that at least initially, I think there are some nuanced differences between uh, social enterprise operation, leadership skills, uh, how to procure funding. Um, in regular business courses, I'm not sure how much discussion you would have on what is a social impact bond and how you go about getting one. So I would put it this way, is that any social entrepreneur or social enterprise needs to have basic grounding and basic business skills to begin with. But then there's another layer of nuance that's on top of that that I would say that's similar to the additional training that you would get if you were going to be a CEO of a not-for-profit. So there, so, and some of those nuances are around, <coughs> I mean, leadership skills, you know, what, what different uh, uh, issues might you confront more often. So for example, in, uh, in the Maritimes, you actually can get an MBA with a specialty in co-op management because there are <coughs> things that, that uh, co-op management has to deal with that's a little bit different than, than regular uh, private enterprise. So I'm going to suggest that it's a good idea to have a separate stream. Um, I'm not, I don't think it has to be undergrad or that it has to be sort of all the way through. I think that that needs to be on top of after you've had some basic business training to sort of call out what some of the different and I think that that's what that program is, is trying to do. But uh, you know, other than that, I think in any business program, you can talk about social enterprise as one of the different kinds of enterprises. But the nuances would be, you'd want it more deep dive, as Kenny says, into some of the different instruments, the different players, how that ecology works. Because uh, I do think it has some, some unique aspects to it. Excellent. Well, take some other questions. I was intrigued by, by uh, two slides, one in your slide and one in your thing. Uh, Brian, your slide paraphrased in a way somewhat what Petra said in that uh, social rate of return and financial rate of return, right? And I noticed that you very neatly had it going out right up the middle. <laughs> in fact, you had the same rate, ultimate financial rate of return as any company. That would be my interpretation. And in your slide, you use the word patient. So in your second slide. I'm intrigued with those two concepts and see whether this can be mainstream or it's just going to remain niche in terms of investment. And I count at that because I look at it from the point of view, for example, social responsible investment, which I, I work on. Well, I'm, I'm wondering what the potential is here in Main Street. Uh, I think Ken's going to probably have some more insights on this than, than I would. It's very much a nascent space. I mean, so that's an open question at this point. We'll do this panel again in five or ten years, and we'll have some better answers for you. Uh, there's certainly lots of examples, right? Uh, uh, and anecdotes can be powerful, uh, both made in Ontario and from other jurisdictions or businesses that have adopted this blended return model. And maybe the line isn't straight down the middle, maybe it skews a little bit this way or skews a little bit that way, but clearly the, the, the underlying objective is a balanced return. They've done quite well for themselves against all of those metrics. So there's, um, there's lots of precedents out there. Um, you know, to what extent will the model ultimately prove scalable and sustainable and you know, mainstream? Uh, it seems like an open question, right? But again, from our perspective, from the government's perspective, this isn't, uh, Panacea. I don't think anybody's suggesting that all uh, you know, for-profit enterprises should you know, uh, go and reincorporate themselves tomorrow, or actually wait for the legislation <laughs> and then reincorporate themselves tomorrow and get on the bandwagon. Uh, it's probably right for some and, and perhaps not for others. And 
And I can uh, paraphrase uh, what Gordon Nixon actually said um, like last month. Uh, Acumen, we co-hosted an event with uh, the Rothman School of Management in Toronto, which uh, was, a, was fantastic. We had the former chief investment officer at, of the Acumen Fund, and then we had Gordon Nixon on a panel together. And somebody asked a very similar question. Um, you know, where, where, where do you see this going? And Gordon <coughs> Nixon's position, what he, what, um, again, I'm um, was that he really saw an opportunity for, uh, you know, imagine if somebody was sitting, sitting down and talking to their bank, uh, an investment advisor on, hey, you know, what kind of investments are in my portfolio? A lot, he could see a lot of them wanting to invest in impact investing, right? They want, they, there's, a, there's a vision to have a, a product, an investment product, uh, that anybody uh, can, can add to their portfolio, right? Um, but the challenge is, uh, the, a, a couple of things, and I think that there's shared challenges between uh, you know, what typical banks are looking for and what the government's looking for. The big overlap that I noticed that you mentioned is, is measurement. How do, you, how do you actually quantify whether or not you're getting a social outcome or not? <coughs> Acumen struggles with this. They've actually just brought on uh, a senior director uh, for, for measurement, for impact measurement. Uh, and everybody struggles with this. So I think that is, uh, that is one thing that certainly needs to happen in order for it to get to the point that, that we're talking about. The other one is um, getting the companies uh, ready to be invested. Uh, so there's a lot of, and we were sort of just talking about this, you know, as far as you know, what kind of coursework would be required in a leader. Um, I, I think that there's there's probably some checks and balances and processes that a, a big institutional investor would want to see be put in place uh, before then being a viable investment. Just one very quick, but I, that short package is about investment ready where you put your funds. Very similar to clean tech. That's almost exactly the same model. Yeah, the, uh, the same struggles that Ptech faces. My old uh, slide when I, I actually spoke to Patriots class, and, and I drew a, a giant comparison between uh, the impact investing space and the Ptech space. So you're exactly right. If I can add just one little thing to that and say that chart, we have the blood, you know, the rate of return going like this. I think the other way to kind of, uh, you know, sort of uh, be constructive is along stage of industry, right? So for example, if, that, if you have startups, that chart would look different if you had second stage. Or if you had large companies like Patagonia, um, and what's the recent one? Now Magazine is, is becoming a B corporation. Mm -hmm. So, but they're an established business, so they may be able to, you know, if they do change your articles of incorporation and go deeply into that space, they may have an interesting curve because they're already established. So I think you want to apply that chart to where, which industry and where that company is in that industry in terms of its stage of development and that chart would be different. And I think there's a lot of startups in the social enterprise space. We've a lot of them. Mostly small startups, you know, struggling and trying to get to stage two and three. And there's not very few that are big uh, entities. Got a question?
So stay tuned. Uh, there's a lot of internal discussion in, in the Acumen Fund uh, to figure out how we can maintain that leadership role in bringing everything back to what the core purpose of this sort of movement is. Uh, because I think there's certainly greed is getting in the, getting in the way, and it will, it will continue and won't stop, right? Um, so I think that we have to do what we can to keep it. Well, it sounds a bit like what you're one interpretation of the impacts of the investor, not the impact yeah. of investors themselves. Not the impact of There's always going to be that tension, I think. But the other thing you were saying about that uh, people looking at the social conscience themselves and wanting to see their investment do the good, as opposed to, yes, maybe they're already set, they don't need to worry about making too much more or wanting to make more, but they invested to make more for others, and that's their social conscience. That's the ideal investor. <laughs> I think we have one more, maybe two more questions. The gentleman at the back, maybe three questions. I'll be quick. Questions uh, for Ryan. Uh, Ryan, it, it, from what you know, what's driving the provincial government's interest <coughs> in social enterprise? Is it labor market issues, uh, reduced budget by using alternate sources of funding, or uh, innovation that leads to co new commercial products or something else? Well, I hate to do the all of the above answer, but you know, I think it is sort of the all of the above. Um, I mentioned in the talk that uh, government uh, is challenged to you know, uh, continue delivering the same services and programs that people expect uh, with budgets being you know, under pressure and the record debt loads. And frankly, the uh, service expectations of citizens continue to grow. Uh, that's true of, of health care, that's true of education, that's true of all of the uh, big ticket expenses. Um, and so finding more sustainable solutions to those problems is going to require innovation. And some of that innovation, I agree with you by the way, some of that innovation can come from government, but we don't have all of the answers. And social enterprise can be an important part of that, uh, finding more sustainable uh, solutions. But as I said again in my talk, I think the reason that the Office for Social Enterprise was deliberately situated in the Economic Development Ministry because uh, it could have gone in a number of different places depending on the flavor you want to sort of put on it is because we see an economic development opportunity for Ontario in the jobs uh, and uh, in, in the entrepreneurism. Uh, we know that uh, entrepreneurism is, is the future of employment. Uh, companies, uh, and this is true of traditional companies, social purpose businesses, what have you. Companies over 10 years old uh, are net job losers. And uh, uh, high growth companies are representing now over 50%. Uh, high growth small startup firms are 50% of the net new jobs being created. So, you know, uh, entrepreneurism is, is the future in terms of uh, uh, job creation. And uh, whether that's entrepreneurism of this flavor or social entrepreneurism, we need to we need to get behind all of it because we need all of those jobs. Excellent. The lady at the back. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a bit of a cold myself, but um, I just wanted to know if if you if you see social entrepreneurs this is for everyone if you see the whole movement of social social entrepreneurism being kind of asset locked, so to speak, in the business schools. Um, is there any real um, effort or concern that it will not really um, be used at the grassroots level to empower the people or the issues that it was meant to, or that, that generated the whole concept or that really <coughs> caused us to move forward? <laughs> okay, so it, it, just to make sure I understand the question, well, I'll, I'll paraphrase it back to you, which is to say, is there a concern that um, that business schools and the bigger part of business co-opting this social entrepreneurship or social enterprise world so that the grassroots um, community-based efforts that, that in some sense spawned some of it um, would would find themselves in the back in the background? Is that sort of well, yes, I, I guess so. That would be one way to sort of um, certainly, uh, certainly, the, the whole notion of community enterprise, social enterprise, and the grassroots aspect 
has been there. And that's what I would say has been the longer term part of it. I would say that the trend or the sudden emergence of it and the high, the, how high it, it is up on a lot of agendas now is really a, a result of the <coughs> history we just talked about. So I can only say this, that I hope that having, an, a, a, let's call it an ecology that's much bigger, expansive, directing more money in those directions, and perhaps to, even putting more research towards what makes them successful or unsuccessful would actually also empower the grassroots side. Because what I found as a social entrepreneur myself um, that, that, uh, that there's a lot that we don't know about what makes it sustainable, successful, and if you've been in those spaces, you know how hard it is to uh, maintain the operations, keep the money flowing. Um, there's an art to it that I think needs to be better understood and better explored, and the more that people understand it, including investors, the easier that will come. If you have to go to every investor, like even I did, and have to explain what a social enterprise was and have an investor say, does that mean you're a not-for-profit? <coughs> Explain to me what this is. You're educating every every time, as opposed to a regular investment. You go, you pitch your deal. You you know, it's much. It's a common language. So I'm hoping that the fact that this space is now blown up to be far bigger will actually make it a much more um, effective uh, concept at all different levels. So that's the way I would, I would sort of see it. It's not necessarily reducing the impact of, or the ability of grassroots organizations to these concepts and do grassroots um, type of work. Right, but I, I guess I'm thinking more along the lines of skill shift, you know, because, you know, grassroots organizations are trying and are are working on, on these issues at the grassroots level, and, and that's where the leadership is right now. And if the skills are developed within, you know, the M MBA schools or management schools or whatever, then what's going to happen to those organizations that, you know, where the executive director doesn't have an MBA or, you know, those kinds of things? I'm of the belief, though, that uh, there's enough like the school of hard knocks, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, having the, the, the real on-street experience is more in a lot of ways than you can get from an MBA, right? right. An MBA will teach you a lot of the theory, mm -hmm. um, but I mean, it's just theory. I mean, how often is it going to go exactly the way the book tells you? Uh, so that's just my philosophy. Um, but you know, I could be wrong. I mean, a lot, but you know, it's true that a lot of business schools are trying to have these um, immersive experiences as well, where you actually go out and you and you travel and you work in a company uh, to see what kind of pitfalls and day-to-day -day issues that they're dealing with. So I think that's helpful. So that might be one way that they're trying to address that. But you know, I I, really, I definitely think that uh, you know, real experience is, is you can't get that. And I'm glad you mentioned the immersive experience because as you were talking, I, as you were speaking, I, I was thinking it doesn't have to be an either or proposition, right? A sort of elite business school versus the kind of you know uh, grassroots. Um, Ideally, uh, there's uh, a blending of the, of the two. Um, you can take the best sort of practices from, I like how you put it, the school of hard knocks, and layer in a little bit of uh, theory and uh, you know, accounting 101. Um, and some schools are uh, starting to get the hang of this. Some schools are emerging as leaders. Uh, Ryerson, in particular, is doing some really interesting things uh, with their business students and experiential learning. And uh, not to sort of plug, you know, government initiatives, but um, our Ministry of Training Colleges and Universities, a couple of months back, did put out an important consultation paper on the future of post-secondary education in Ontario. And there was a, a chapter in there, my favorite chapter anyway, on, on experiential learning, the importance of that going forward. As uh, someone who, um, however many years ago, went through, had an opportunity to go through a, a co-op program up in Waterloo and see how that shaped my uh, personal career prospects uh, going forward. Uh, I think we need more of that kind of stuff. Uh, and it's good to see uh, that the government is um, starting to be part of the solution. And by the way, credit where credit is due, uh, the federal government in their last budget, uh, I think the number, I'm actually not gonna say the number, but it was some uh, tens of millions of dollars for an organization called MyTax. Uh, which um, some of you may have heard of, but uh, they're basically uh, uh, an experiential learning organization that helps link up um, uh, 
students and business students with uh, work placements and companies, and they've done some tremendous stuff, and, and the investment by the federal government will help them expand their program offerings. So we need more of that, less than that, not less than that, and, and let's bridge that divide so we don't have the sort of either or proposition, right? I appreciate we've gone over a little bit. I'm gonna let the gentleman have the, the last quick question, and then very quick question. Um, we spoke about it's very difficult to measure the social impact mm -hmm. of these enterprises. How do you distinguish um, the investment criteria when you do want to invest in these social enterprises compared to um, a normal investment? Certainly, kind of your hurdles and your internal rates will be um, lessened most likely. So, what other qualities criteria do you use to um, gauge it as a good investment? Like a, a, a social investment. Yeah, the, the, the difference between uh, how you measure a social investment versus kind of a traditional blue chip investment. Yeah, okay, I mean, what I look for in uh, typical investments, and I'm not an impact investor, I wish I was, um, but I mean, you look for uh, revenue streams, opt-in agreements, uh, strong partnerships with uh, people up and down the value chain, uh, and then what their previous backing looks like, what their previous investment looks like. Um, how that changes for a social impact, uh, for a social uh, enterprise, uh, I think that you definitely want to look at, uh, I'm trying to think about it a little bit more here. So what I would think about is you know, the actual product. I would say I would focus a whole lot more on uh, the value created in both the product and the price point, because that's really important investments. Um, so that's one criteria that I would evaluate by. Um, as far as you know, measurability of impact, um, that's difficult because you know at the very least they, I would need to see how many uh, units have been sold. Where that where it gets difficult though is okay. So how many more books were they able to read at night because they have a solar powered light? Um, that's really hard, right? Uh, I, I don't know if I would even try to ask, ask or answer that question. Uh, but that is the sort of thing, that if I were a social impact investor, that's the sort of thing I would be really, really curious about. But I'm sure there are probably some other ways that you can sort of zero in and imply a real tangible impact. But I think what the takeaway is that the process of zeroing in it takes a lot of time and energy. So if there is an infrastructure in place to be able to measure that uh, quicker, uh, just as easy as you can measure whether or not uh, they're profitable or not. Uh, I'm going to allow uh, Petra just to say a few final words of, uh, of thanks. Okay. Yeah. Well, <coughs> first of all, let me thank both Kenny and Ryan for being here today. We really appreciate it. And we don't actually give you a mug or a t-shirt, <laughs> so we do make a... Uh, you make a donation to your organization, Kenny knows this. I don't, know, I don't know if we're allowed to make a donation to your organization. We're <laughs> <laughs> certainly allowed to make a donation to the United Oh, okay. that would be good. So we will be doing that on, on your behalf. So thank you very much for being here. And uh, thank you to the audience for being here, especially a number of my students who are here for their extra participation marks. Make sure you sign the sheet. And uh, <laughs> thank you to everybody else who's here as well. So we've gone over, and also I guess I will thank uh, Bruce for moderating, uh, being our moderator tonight, and Dave, who's at the back here, Dave Tosek, who is uh, filming the whole thing. So you're on film. Yeah. You can watch yourself <laughs> on YouTube eventually, or if you want to rerun this this talk, uh, you can. So uh, that will be available at some point. I don't know, Dave, if you know when it's going to be available, but it will be available at some point. Soon. Right? <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much for coming. We hope it was informative, and have a wonderful rest of the evening.